Okay. Okay. Good evening, y'all. My name is Sandy Milford. Uh, so my background, I graduated here from UTPA in 2008 with a biology degree. Let's see. Is it working? Okay. I got to go do fun stuff like that. Loved every second of it. Couldn't find a job when I got out of school. Had some other things going on, so I did the next most rational thing you can think of. I went to art school. <laughs> so, let's see. And you know, I've been an artist since I was very young. I've always drawn. This is actually quite a large picture of a hornet's nest. I thought I'd go into bio-illustration. What a fun way to make a living, right? So yeah, okay. You know, got some stuff going on here. We've got a hip joint. Bio-illustration is actually very important, by the way. They, sometimes artists can tell you something so much more than a photograph. So it's a really important profession to go into that I might still go into. So this was all good. I'm a great observational artist. And, and, then, and then I took a jewelry and metal smithing course and kind of started to go a little crazy. So, so this was totally something new to me. I'd never done 3D objects before. I'd never forged with metal, played with fire. It was really great. It was a great cathartic experience. So, so this is my journey through making science-inspired art and also maybe why, why we kind of need art for some personal development and using hands. So, so some metalsmithing experience with, uh, experimented with some etching enameling. Enameling is when you put, um, it's kind of like glazing in ceramics, but on metal, right? So this is Champlevé. I etched stuff out of metal. Then I put powdered glass in the little etched area and fired it. It's pretty, it's really, really fun. It also requires a lot of safety precaution. And then what do I got up next? Somewhere in there, I helped make the UTPA class ring, right? I don't know why that picture's there. I think it's out of order, but oh well. And then at the uh, university here, we have Donna Swigert here on your left. I can't remember the gentleman on the right. Donna Swigert came to UTPA and she's the new jewelry metals professor. She's been here for about five or six years. She helped us design the ring and she did her master's in CAD CAM, computer aided modeling and computer uh, aided design. Let me mix that up a little bit. And so she wrote a grant. The jewelry department got a 3D printer. She got Rhinoceros, which is a 3D modeling program that I use and that is actually very specific for 3D printing, and then I started to go even more, a little more crazy. So, what else did I do? These are the first things I 3D modeled. So I took a lot of jewelry metal smithing courses, and hence a lot of my assignments were wearable art. Wearable art, later they turned into just kind of objects, and I might go more into sculpture. So here we have some rings, and these were one of the first few things we could print out on our printer. So I was really happy with them really really happy with them it takes a while to sculpt digitally but it's like anything it's a tool you learn how to use it it's uh, of course once i started doing this i got calls from my sisters and it's like oh you can 3d print anything and i'm like no it doesn't work that way it totally doesn't work that way so so uh here's a screenshot of me modeling a blood vessel brooch Yes, a brooch. And this assignment was actually, hey, make the inside of something. This assignment was make a cross section of something. Take something from the inside and put it on the outside. And because I'm a total nerd, I was like, I'm gonna take my hemoglobin and stick it on my, on my shoulder. And uh, here's another screenshot of uh, a 3D modeled sickle cell. So, and still bio-illustration. Bio-illustration, still thinking that there. Still thinking that there. And then here is some of the 3D printed final products. The one on your left is the sickle cell. The one on the right is a regular blood vessel. So, so uh, you have your own 3D printer? I, this is from the 3D printer used in the jewelry and metals department here at the university. So it is a large Stratasase printer. It looks like a big fridge. Is it like the same printer they have uh, in the engineering building? No, it is not. It is not. So this prints an ABS plastic, and it is also called additive modeling. As you see, there's ridges on there. So this would, if you were making parts, it would probably be for prototyping, right? Maybe not a finished piece, but for our purposes, I used the plastic to make my final pieces and really liked it. So I also had to learn a bit about photography when I became an artist, so to make these pictures really nice, right? And then... I kind of went all out and I made a DNA necklace, right? It's pretty fun, totally pretty fun, right? I went to a jewelry metal smithing conference once and I wore it around and believe it or not, it was not the most fantastic thing that someone was wearing around. So, so I just started, I was like, what do I know? What do I just, I hit a niche and I was like, I love biology. And then I'm taking all these art classes and I'm being encouraged to 
to do whatever comes to my mind was well with fits within certain assignments. So what else? And then I went even a little more crazy. So uh, here's, a, here's a large installation piece. And this was, a, this was a little weird for me too, because as you'll notice, it's a large object kind of mounted to the wall. Uh, and this is about the phylogeny of extant chordates. So this is about the tree of life, about all living things that have a backbone. And I wanted to reimagine that and make it kind of fun and make it very elegant. It was something I was very fond of when I taught or when I uh, took comparative vertebrate anatomy. So I reimagined all the key characteristics in that tree of life as wearable sculptures. So there's 15 brooches up there and those all represent 15 key points on the tree of life, right? At the very top, we have a notochord, then a brain case, and then jaws, and then bone cells, and then fins, and then lobed fins before things started coming on land. So very major key points and characteristics. And I also had to learn how to use a sand blaster. You'll see there's a big spine up there. Is anyone ever familiar with Gorilla Tape? No? Big black roll of Gorilla Tape, really expensive actually. Well, I covered the whole piece of plexiglass in Gorilla Tape, the entire roll. This goes my $10 roll of Gorilla Tape. And uh, then I, I cut out the spine and then I went to the sculpture studio and used the giant sand blaster to blast into those uh, areas of the spine and kind of blowing me away as it's going because it's, really it's a really big sand blaster. All right, so this was, a, this was a big deal for me because I put together, even though it's, a, it's it's not a large installation piece, but I put together an installation piece all on my own, and um, I really, really liked it. If you know any chiropractors that would like this in their office, please tell me. I'm trying to sell it, so, <laughs> all right. Um, sometimes, so here's a little deviation from, from biology, and so artists, I think we like to tell stories. So, so far y'all have getting my story about biology. So sometimes you find there are things in your life that you can draw on to make other pieces. So this is still wearable art, okay? This is actually, this will be very brief. This is actually a mouthpiece. This is about emotional abuse and speech constriction. And this is about a time when I was a young adult, when I was told what to do and I was not allowed to say very many things. So I actually, there was actually a show here at the university about um, violence against women. This isn't necessarily just against women. This is a very unisex thing. So I devised a piece of art about it and actually won best in show for that. But it was also featured in a gallery exhibition and in a book about uh, wearable art through experience. So sometimes you find you can draw on different experiences to make different things. Uh, the prior slide, the, the, the dice or something attached to it, what was that symbolizing? What's this one? Yeah. Okay, so the blue cards are, uh, okay, so very awkward subject here. So the blue cards are actually constrictions, right? So this is to represent something that metaphorically I wore around every day for a very long time. And then the cards inserted were what I could and could not say. So it's a very withdrawn, abstract expression of this time. And I get a lot of questions like, hey, why didn't you make this in plaster? Why didn't you make this in metal? Why is it ABS plastic? Uh, that's what I was using at the time, but I also like the fact that it is rigid and cold and very sterile, very sterile looking. So um, emotional abuse is something that's very ubiquitous. It's been very normalized. And this looks like you can pluck it off a store shelf and use on someone. So it's kind of just how it turned out that way. I'm not sure where I'll if I'm gonna continue the project. I kind of wanna continue it as a photo project. I wanna transcend making it about objects. So, so we'll see, we'll see. So hence, my journey as an artist, we find other things. I did, that's kind of a, that's kind of another version. That's about programming someone so that when you press the button, um, it's already programmed to speak what you want it to say. So those are those little things you find in the Hallmark cards, by the way, I ordered a bunch of those. <laughs> so it's, it's a very, it's a very rough, it's a rough one. So that's how I got cut around that. All right. Some sketchbooks some sketchbook photos. You do have to go through some planning processes. This is very stimulating to me to go from rough draft to final product. All right. 
Here I'm making an ovum. I am making an egg, and I have it with me today. Y'all can totally see it too. And then somewhere along the way, I, did, I decided I was going to make sperm. And this is where y'all are going to really freak out, okay? So on the left, you have a sperm necklace. On the right, I have an ovum with sperm in it. I decided I was going to put magnets in the sperm and little magnets in the, in the ovum. And it's actually a very kinetic object. And uh, for some reason, I have a guy wearing the ovum and a girl wearing the sperm necklace. It kind of just turned out that way. It's kind of about role reversal. So, yeah. When I went to a metalsmithing conference, uh, we wore these around, and it was a lot of, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So, so somewhere along the way, I decided to do this, and it's been, it was a great time in the metalsmithing studio. So, uh, maybe you're getting to this at the end, but uh, you're trying to sell these? Eventually. Eventually, you know how many people have asked me for like a refrigerator sperm magnet set and I'm, I'm working on an inventory. <laughs> I know, I might have some for y'all, if y'all are good, okay. So, so yes, eventually I'm kind of working on my own biological jewelry line and then hopefully a, a line of products. Like one thing I really want to do is a sarcomere kind of toy. I know we have animations. I know we have models. A sarcomere is a muscle cell for those, but to have like just a little playful, like little sarcomere kind of toy, especially if I can make it kind of cheap that we can, that we can fund to different high school classrooms. So, so something, so it, this is an av... Mm -hmm. I know. I used to uh, do a supplemental instruction here for genetics, and uh, Dr. Scott Gunn is that professor, and he saw this, and he wants one. So, all right. And is that the? And this is this is my last thing. This is kind of my most recent work. For some reason, I started making models of deformed sperm, which actually happen in real life. Um, these. Uh, what, what do I got here? I got the two-headed one, and I got the kink tail. These all happen in real life for some reason, and. Uh, other different defects and I started putting them in floral patterns on the wall. I'm trying to figure out why I'm doing that maybe to represent um, er, the fact that these things happen in nature yet even though bad things happen you know nature is still very beautiful so not everything can be very perfect and very ordered. So this is my most recent totally most recent work. All right so I believe that's my last slide. So uh, maybe I missed something, but so you're actually getting on a uh, using CAD CAM uh, yourself to design these pieces and then print them out on the 3D printer. Yes, I don't actually have access to the 3D printer anymore. It was while I was taking art courses, but I can order some from different service bureaus. Is anyone familiar with Shapeways? Yeah, so, so and there's different service bureaus. There's different 3D printing companies that print in different materials um, that you can order. So sometimes there's SLA, there's photopolymer, there's the ABS plastic, and then they all have a different price range. So, uh, mm -hmm. so you run across many other artists who are doing the biology thing with 3D printing? A select few. So uh, there's kind of like, I guess it's like a little mini cult. I don't know. I, I, I met a guy out in California who he did microbiology, but now he's doing entertainment design because he didn't like the work. He's a little like me. He kind of needs art to fuel his passion. So now he does also bioinformation like graphics as well. There's a, a woman who went to, she did a dual degree at Brown University in RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. She also did a whole series of biological jewelry. So. There's, there's a lot of other artists that take inspiration from nature as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the melting point on the plastic that you, that you are using? Oh my so we tried to figure this out once. So one day, oh, for some reason one day Donna decided she was going to put a piece of ABS plastic in the microwave. It never melted and it just stank. So. I'm very sensitive to smelly things. Working in a metalsmithing studio does not agree with my nose. Um, the plastic itself, do I have any metal with me? No. The plastic itself can get burned out in a kiln. Okay, so when you cast metal, if you're making jewelry, uh, you kind of make a mold and you have a wax in that mold and you put it in the kiln and it, the heat in the kiln, we're talking over like 2000 degrees here, burns out that wax. The same temperature, because we've done it before, will burn out the plastic as well. So I know a couple thousand degrees 
will burn the ABS plastic. I don't know the exact melting point. Uh, no, I'm, I'm telling you because I like the idea that you're trying to play and put electronics with the, in the plastic, but sometimes electronics, certain parts can become <coughs> cut and it may damage your design. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's good, I, li I like the idea, but uh, taking, uh, have in mind that mm -hmm. the melting point, how much can handle it. Well, like a card's not going to get that hot. Like the card piece that you were using for the mask, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you made any of your own electronics to put in there, it would be an issue. It might be an issue. Mm -hmm. The ABS plastic I know is actually very, very strong. Actually, when you print it out very thin, it's very flexible. It has some applications that way too, right? But it is very strong. We've had other, other I had a friend who made a big collar and she put LED lights in it and it kind of lights up too. So. <laughs> before the conversation started, but it says, quote, ABS is amorphous and therefore has no true melting point, unquote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there you go. Do you have an Etsy? I don't have an Etsy yet. Do you know how hard it is to start your own business? So creative labor is still labor. <laughs> And when you're just getting started and you're working on the side as well, um, making an inventory is rather hard. But I'm working on it. I've been working the past year and I've been saving and I'm working on some new designs and starting my own biological jewelry. So, so we'll see. I can take my name down and if I'm ever in the news for something or other, we'll see. No, no, my, my, my goal is to forever blend the, the arts and sciences. I think that artists can be inspired by science. I think scientists can be inspired by artists. I think we need scientists that need art in their applications, and we need artists that understand science. And that, that was a really cool thing for me, because when I went to the jewelry and metalsmithing studio, I used my, my chemistry minor kind of more than I'd ever like used it in a chem lab. So when I was etching, when I was forging, I had to know properties of metal, and it all kind of clicked and made sense because it was very hands-on and applicable. So. Right. It, I think it all it, it all blends very well. So. <laughs> the metal forging is that on school property or where is that at? There is a jewelry metal smithing studio at the Visual Arts Building, and that is on Klausner. Is anyone familiar with the Arts Annex? Or well, actually, it used to be the the testing site or the UTPA Annex. No, yeah. It's a kind of sort. It's on Klausner. I don't have the exact address in my head, but it's on Klausner between. Um, what is it between Freddie and Canton? It's across from KFC, right? And um, that is where the Visual Arts Building is now. It used to be, when I was taking the courses, it used to be here on campus where the brand new Fine Arts Auditorium is. It was old and falling apart, and they tore it down, and now there's a brand new one over on Klausner. And uh, that's where all the facilities are, printmaking, sculpture, painting, photography, and the jewelry and metal smithing studio. They have a large um, hands-on, forging studio in the front, and then there's a 3D printing computer lab in the back, and it's all nice and brand new. Yeah, because my follow-up question would be, as a student, do I need to have an art major to attend or participate in these classes, or are some of them electives, or <coughs> how, how would that work? You can't, okay, as a student, I would encourage you, if you are a student to, and you need upper level courses, to contact some of the art professors directly. So maybe if you wanted to take an upper level painting, maybe you don't need painting one, two, and three to take what they're going to teach in painting four. It's kind of individually based on what the professor wants to do. Um, if you have a specific project you're wanting to work on, say you want access to this 3D printer, you would contact Donna Swigert, and I can put her email up here, and she would listen to your project and maybe let you come in and use the facilities. She is all about collaboration with different departments. Right now she's teaching a game development class. Uh, she's co-teaching it with Emmett Tomai. He's in the computer science or computer engineering department where it's computer science majors and artists in the same class designing uh, characters and what are they called sprites. And then they write the code, they put them in Unity and they create a 2D or 3D game. So it's a very collaborative class. So she's all about collaboration, but if you had a specific project that you're like, I need to learn how to 3D model for, uh, you could ask if you can go sit in on the class, right? So, Ooh, any questions? No? So, I got a question. So you mentioned that uh, you've got some other stuff going on in your life, but you're trying to turn this into a business? 
I know, eventually, yes. Hopefully. So, so uh, you know, eventually, uh, often never happens. So, kind of, what's the what's the, the timeline for this? And hopefully by the end of the year, I did just uh, take some time for myself so I can work on my portfolio more, almost full time, but not quite full time yet. I'm working on a few new techniques. I'm going back to illustration a little bit, but I'm also adding in some Adobe Illustrator. Um, I took a workshop last year where we used Illustrator to translate into using a laser cutter. So that's kind of something I want to push up my skills on for some, some laser cut. So laser cut would have metal of some type that you'd be working on? Or? Maybe not metal. I'm thinking wool felt. So I, I, I have a few projects going on. I have a map out of a electron transport chain that I want to do very large. I want, I'm, I'm thinking medical school in the future wants a nice display in their lobby. So, here thing. And um, I know, right? Right? Kind of, sort of. See, this is, this is me being a little crazy. I've got, like, I've got large projects. I've got little projects. And, um, but I'm working on some Adobe Illustrator techniques so that I can laser cut wool felt. These uh, objects that you've produced in the past and you were showing up there with your slides, mm -hmm. uh, do you have all these somewhere in your house or apartment? Or I you do. Sold some I've sold some pieces. I've sold some pieces. I brought a few with me here today. Uh, sometimes uh, we keep them because I've had them in some periodic shows over the last couple of years. So you submit to juried shows and um, Sometimes when you get accepted, you get cash prizes, or if you get accepted again and again, you get a gallery to represent you. And then eventually they start paying you to make pieces so you can keep having shows. So I was thinking with uh, the 3D printer, you know, artists are, uh, you know, you can produce one uh, item, uh, one sculpture, <coughs> whatever, and then it's, it's difficult to actually produce a whole bunch. But with 3D printing, mm -hmm. uh, theoretically, you've, you've got the, the CAD CAM design for one, you can just continue to pump them out and sell uh, the sperm necklace or whatever uh, in volume and, and uh, uh, so do that so in, in some ways it's actually the 3d printing medium uh, is great for an artist I would think if you're trying to you know, get your work out there to a larger audience is there lots of rework or anything that you have to do on these pieces after they come out of the 3d printer or are they good to go oh so that's trial and error so I have this little this is like this is um Sometimes you don't know what's going to come out. This is a tray that sits down in our 3D printer, and then the additive printing prints onto it. This something messed up with this. You see the little sperm tails there? Something happened, and the, the machine stopped. And so um, I took this out and saved it. Right? And the, the brown is support material. The white is build material. That's what would stay. Uh, but so sometimes errors happen, and sometimes when you design and 3D model a project, it is not perfect or if you have not made it completely sound and completely closed it will print really funky so so if you have overlapping lines you know it's going to print and there's going to be this hole and then there will be little stringy plastic everywhere and sometimes it's quite beautiful happy accidents do happen so it is for prototyping so sometimes yeah it does mess you do mess up when you make something or especially if you're trying to get something very sized <laughs> Actually, I had it hanging on my wall. I kind of like it. Mother Nature there, and you, you have your own mutations going on there. Yeah, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. No, I'm going to keep this my example. <laughs> my example, y'all. So, <laughs> are there any other questions? No? Would you like to eventually open up a business or something like that, or how would you see yourself? No, I do, I do want to try being an entrepreneur. Uh, maybe not forever. But I do eventually want to try opening up a business as well. Going back to the, the 3D printing of printing out several objects, that is great. However, sometimes in the world of fine art, sometimes you want to make one thing. Yeah, so I certainly agree with that. But if you come up with something like uh, could be useful for medical education, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you want to have that in every classroom uh, for medical doctors being trained and wanting to see the blood vessels or you know, defective sperm or whatever it might be, uh, then if you could print out, you know, a thousand of them and sell them to a thousand different universities, then, uh, you know, that's a business. I agree. I totally plan on doing that. So, is there any other questions? No? Would anyone like little magnetic sperm? Okay. So... So I got four. Okay, so these are kind of an older version. They're not the greatest. And um, don't give them to small children. The tails do pop out. And there's a tiny magnet inside. So, 
So I'm going to blindly throw these into the audience. <laughs> okay? So we're gonna we're gonna get the right side. Nah, we're gonna we're gonna get the right. I'm gonna close my eyes. Are y'all ready? Y'all ready? ready? Someone get it. <laughs> Someone get it? No. Okay. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna try. I don't know. I was did not do well in sports when I was little. <laughs> no. Sorry, that almost hit you in the face. <laughs> okay. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna. Try. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, we got one more. We got one more. We got one more. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go. We got it. Okay. I know, right? <laughs> so, okay, we're good. Okay, thanks.